Yu-Gi-Oh! GX, the sequel to one of the most culturally impactful anime of the 90s and 2000s. This series, running from 04 to 08, spanning four seasons, followed the main character of Jaden Yuki and his classmates running through a more slice-of-life inspired story at Duel Academy, the training ground for the next generation of professional duelists. With the day-to-day -day goings on at the school taking center stage, whether it's exams, student life, duels against rival schools, or dealing with the ghost of Jinzo, wait what? Yeah, while there were a couple of supernatural elements to the early stages of GX, as to be expected from a sequel to Yu-Gi-Oh!, it was largely just one-off episodes or story beats that passed the time of the school year, fleshing out characters and the world around them. However, this unique take on the franchise was quickly replaced by a bulk standard Fate of the World story, which made it a little jarring on first viewing when the story pivoted mid-first season to being another supernatural good versus evil group story, robbing GX of its uniqueness immediately and making it far blander for the remainder of the season as a result. Luckily, they re-pivoted to the day-to-day -day structure in the second season until the eventual barge-in of the Society of Light, which sort of highlights the major issue with GX from a story point of view. It clearly wanted to be a spanning epic to follow up the DM era, but couldn't commit to an overarching plot hook, unlike the original's ties to the Millennium Items, which at least provided a through line between the arcs of the manga and the non-filler arcs of the anime. GX had four different antagonistic forces, between the Shadow Riders, Society of Light, Yubel, and Night Shroud, with a through line not being established until Season 3 with Yubel being tied into the previous season's Light of Destruction causing a lot of disjointedness across revisiting the series as a whole, with tonal whiplash being common. Needless to say, GX could have done better if it had a central focus from the start to drive the story around, giving a proper end goal in mind from the beginning, like how most shonen anime at the time did. Even if your end goal is far, far off, it still gives you an endgame to work towards. So why am I talking about this at such length? Following a year after the anime's introduction in Japan, the GX manga would begin its publication in Weekly Shonen Jump in late 2005, with its initial chapter making it clear from the word go that this was a different story from the anime prior, with some setup beats being the same, they completely skip Jaden's entrance exam but still reference how he beat Crowler to be enrolled in Duel Academy, but taking on different attributes. What sets it apart from the anime is its approach to the long game and character growth, as the GX manga takes the bones of what the anime did before it and runs miles with it, crafting a unique story from its predecessor that follows through to the end, with a centralized antagonistic force and a through line that is established in the first few chapters. The manga in 64 chapters manages to tell a multi-arc story from beginning to end that never seems to question what it wants to accomplish. And as such, I feel many who enjoy Yu-Gi-Oh! and the different series it encompasses should give the GX manga a true shot. This will be a bit of a love letter to the series overall, going into many of the characters, their arcs and growth, some of the major plot beats, and, by necessity, the ending. As such, this will be a heavily spoiler-filled retrospective on the manga as a whole, so if you'd like to give it a shot without any spoilers at all, you can read the entire series officially through Shonen Jump. Even still, I will still provide blanket spoiler warnings once we get into the end game, giving a large warning before we discuss the ending and the chapters leading up to it. So with that said, let's get into it. This is why you should read the GX manga. Let's start off by talking about the characters of GX. Jaden in the early chapters does appear to be the same character as he is in the anime, with the only difference being his deck uses a completely different set of elemental heroes compared to his anime counterpart, using monsters like Stratos, Ocean, Woodsman, and Terra Firma. And just like his anime counterpart, the suffering would seep in from there. Jaden's current deck of elemental heroes was left to him by his friend and hero Koyo Hibiki, one of the greatest professional duelists of the era, leaving him not only Terra Firma, said to be a unique one-of-a-kind card, but also his partner Wing Karibo, an odd monster that appears to have a spirit itself. Unfortunately, shortly after this, Koyo falls into a coma and leaves Jaden with a sense of guilt that he caused Koyo's condition, only helped by his new friend in Wing Karibo. Jaden specifically holds a lot of growth over the course of the early chapters, recognizing roughly halfway through the series that he's relied on Koyo's deck for his strength for far too long specifically taking steps to put away Elemental Hero and move towards its own unique strategy of Best Hero Baby! Message Supremacy! Dark Lord Banisher Born! 
Jaden's story very much is focused on his own personal growth, shedding the happy-go-lucky and lackadaisical attitude of the early chapters to grow into someone who will put himself on the line to protect others using his own strength. It's pretty on par with his anime counterpart, which isn't something I can say for arguably the other main character. Chaz is probably the most different out of the primary five in the cast, and that's mostly thanks to him losing the general school elitist asshole vibe he gave off in the original. Manga Chaz does have a little bit of that originally until his duel with Jaden, but he quickly ditched it by the end of the third chapter to focus more on his own growth as a duelist. Also, Chaz would be the only other character with a spirit monster like Jaden. Oh, that's so nice of you, boss! You're talking about me, huh? Oh god, not that one! Chaz's ace monster also happens to be his spirit and partner, the extremely powerful Light and Darkness Dragon, given life by Wing Karibo back when Chaz was a little kid at one of Koyo's matches. His entire deck is dragon-themed, with a focus around a pivot between light and dark, primarily in his monsters Light and Dark End Dragon. Yeah, Chaz out here using synchros before they were a thing. To be fair, in the manga they're clearly established to be main deck monsters, but Chaz only ever summons them with cheat-out cards, so they might as well be synchros. While he starts out like the standard Chaz you'd expect, High in acclaim, kind of an ass, with chops to back it up, he quickly develops into a far more grounded character, aiming to develop himself into the best version of himself, leading to one of the best characters in the series, being a lot more active in the story as a whole. Aside from the side characters all having more unique deck layouts than the original anime, with Bastion on a yokai themed zombie strategy, Alexis on blizzard monsters, and Cyrus on effectively better Viacroids, the characters here are all effectively the same as their anime counterparts, with the only major difference being Bastion, whose later anime characteristics are clear and present from the first chapter, challenging Jaden to a duel to get Alexis's phone number because he doesn't have the guts to ask her himself. Without question though, the character that gets shafted the absolute most in the transition to the manga is unfortunately Alexis, who is established to be one of the top duels in the school only to devolve into effectively eye candy for other characters and loses every single one-on-one -on -one match she's shown in throughout the series. Four in total, even getting OTK'd by David. Speaking of... Reggie and David serve as our primary antagonists for the early chapters of GX, being framed as American students who have come as part of a pseudo-exchange program in return for Atticus and Zane going to the Americas. However, it's quickly established that the two are more interested in searching for cards with a spirit for nefarious purposes, with Reggie being a fairy duelist sporting the Splendid Venus, and David being a machine duelist sporting the Big Saturn. A point of note here, if they're not named Jaden and have a Planet Series card, they're either evil as hell or they're being controlled by the Big Bad. David is very much a bulk standard villain, being open to control from his master and catering to his every whim. But Reggie is far more interestingly developed, establishing very early on that she's the more tactical of the two, purposefully throwing her duel with Bastion so that David would have to collect the spirits from Jaden and Chaz, using hostage mentality to sway multiple duels into her favor, and having an actual backstory that leaves her still as an integral part of the plot after her initial arc. Also, she plays actually good cards. I'm sorry, her deck has Valhalla and Christia in it. How does anyone in GX fight that? The later arcs bring in the remaining five Americans, with Jesse and Adrian being almost complete downgrades from the anime. Jesse's really into bugs now. Axel being fairly similar, chasing the secrets of the Shadow Games down, and Aster being mostly the same, being a pro duelist whose father was a famous card designer that died under mysterious circumstances. Probably the biggest deviation of all though was James Crocodile Cook, who's been adapted from a bulk standard side character in the original to a decently menacing threat in the manga, clearly being the replacement for David once he's out of commission. Principal McKenzie, Reggie's father, is our big bad of the series, though it's clear that he's not in control of his own mind or body here. Rather, the primary evil force controlling him is, which is mostly shrouded in mystery across the series, only seeing hints at it from flashbacks to ancient Egypt, where the priests use Wing Karibo to contain his heart and weigh his soul against the feather of Mott, being so evil he was promptly sealed away, threatening to rise again if he gathers the fragments of his soul, locked in the Planet series cards and the spirit of Winged Karibo, still containing his heart to this day. 
The only other characters I should note here are the Habikis being Koyo, who we've mentioned previously, and his sister Midori, who's a professor at Duel Academy and acts as a pseudo-guardian for Jaden throughout the series, to the point where she's even willing to put her own life on the line to help stop Reggie before she can hurt him. Midori is the central staff character we see through the manga's run, with Crowler only showing up to antagonize Jaden from time to time, but she does have her moments of absolute badassery. Her entire duel with Reggie is just... Mwah! GX's story, while taking many beats from the anime and assuming you're familiar with it for the baseline of what to expect, takes on various subtle differences to its early chapters before fully diverting from the anime structure. For example, there are early duels against Staff, Chaz, Bastion, and Alexis, with many even having the same beats as in the anime, like with Wing Karibo level 10 taking the duel against Chaz. But while beats might be the same, the feel is vastly different. Spirits are established very early on. Not just in Wing Karibo, but also in Light and Darkness Dragon, Chaz's partner, with there being an air of mystery about them set up to be solved. The only threat of expulsion placed in the early chapters is a falsified threat against Cyrus, with all other duels being either for settling differences or simply low stakes wagers, like Bastion wanting Alexis's phone number or Jaden wanting to borrow a DVD of the Battle City Finals. The more serious aspect of the story, as well as our main threat, makes its first appearance in Chapter 10, with a flashback to how Jaden got his deck and the spirit in the first place, when they were left to him by his friend Koyo Hibiki, the reigning world champion. Some dark force placed Koyo into a coma shortly after he left his cards to Jaden, which Jaden continues to use to the present, being the elemental heroes in their signature card, Terra Firma, said to be the only copy in existence as one of the 10 Planet series monsters, with each named after a planet at the time. Sorry, Pluto. I heard about Pluto? It's messed up, right? After this introduction to the concepts, we're immediately introduced not only to Zane, returning from his study abroad, but also to Reggie and David, the American duelist looking for what the Japanese Academy has to offer, with sinister motives right below the surface, sporting a planet series monster each, searching for spirit monsters for unknown reasons. Through a welcome home tournament thrown with a duel against Zane as the prize, we launch ourselves into the homecoming tournament arc. Tournament! Which in turn gives us some of the absolute best duels in the entire series. We're talking Cyrus versus Chaz, proving his power to his older brother to fall to the sudden might of Light and Dark and Dragon. Bastion versus Jaden, with Bastion's deck being fine-tuned to stop the methods Jaden might use to fusion summon Terra Firma. David versus Alexis, where David shows how strong he really is by OTKing Alexis with extreme prejudice. Chaz's shadow game against David, where the true power of light and darkness dragon peeks through, dispelling the shadow game on summon, hinting at its true nature. And of course, Jaden and Chaz's rematch in the finals, which is unquestionably one of, if not the absolute best duel in the entire series. And I wouldn't dare spoil how this one plays out. While the arc that follows, being an American exchange arc, isn't quite as memorable as the prior, it still has its own standout moments, specifically the duel between Aster and Jaden, being the debut of the masked heroes in the manga, as well as Aster's vision heroes. But unfortunately, while the arc clearly had a story it wanted to tell, corporate mandates got in the way yet again. By the time the exchange arc was underway, 5Ds had already started, and it was clear that the GX manga was being pushed to the back burner fast with the pressure to wrap up ASAP so that 5Ds could have a turn, leading to a rather rushed final arc. But the ending of the arc still holds some serious promise, which we'll cover in a bit. I've been holding off on going in depth on this point for a bit as it's not quite as critical to the plot itself outside of a select few cards, but the GX manga has so many iconic cards to it that have all have massive impacts on the TCG, arguably far more than the GX anime has. Obviously you have the elemental heroes here, which gave us the six Omni fusions, Stratos, Ocean, Parallel World fusion, and other various one-offs, masked heroes like YEAH BABY! Sorry. The entire Vision Hero line, which mind you has been fairly lovingly adapted to the TCG, many of the side characters' decks like Chaz's Boss Dragons, Duality and Shadow's Light, Bastion's Yokai's giving us both Mizuki and Gozuki, Midori's Dark Lords giving us Superbia and Desire, Cyrus giving us Barbaroid, Reggie's Fairy Support in Christia and Valhalla, and various other random cards like Ryo, Tyrant Neptune and... 
Can, can I call out that card? It's literally a spoiler for the last arc. Point being, the GX manga has a plethora of cards that it's influenced the TCG with, and new cards from here are adapted almost every year, even with many being vanilla in the manga and getting absolutely busted effects in the TCG by the time they're released. Looking at you, Christia and Shadow Mist. Uh, editor's note here, uh, I was actually editing the audio for this when uh, we just got a ping that both Electro Gunner and Division, cards used by Axel Prodi in the manga exclusively, are now being adapted to the OCG. God, I love this game. But seriously, the main deck mast heroes, please adapt them and make them good. We're going to be getting into the series ending now, so consider this your final spoiler warning. While many aspects of the endgame are not super spoiler affected, I still want to give those who want to read it without knowing it a chance to leave. Okay, we all good? Awesome. In flashbacks and dialogue through the earlier sections of the Homecoming Tournament arc, we learn the nature of both Jaden and Chaz's spirits, namely in that Wink Karibo was not only a spirit, it was the literal representation of the Egyptian afterlife's judgment process. In Egyptian mythology, you are said to be judged by the gods upon your death, where your heart is removed from your soul and weighed against the feather of Mont, where the soul's sins would be on full display. Stay balanced with the feather, and the soul is deemed worthy of presenting to Osiris to enter Saket Aru, or the Field of Reeds, which is the Egyptian version of Paradise. However, if your heart is deemed to weigh more than the feather, you're deemed to be a sinful soul, leaving the heart to be eaten by Amit, which in turn destroys the soul permanently. For Yu-Gi-Oh, in ancient Egypt, the heart was taken from the soul and held by the spirit known simply as the white feathered spirit to be weighed. However, this particular soul's heart was so full of sin that it turned the spirit dark, far outweighing the feather of Mott on the scale. The spirit's name was Tragodia, and he was deemed so dangerous to the people of Egypt that the priests, along with the winged spirit using the Feather of Mott, sealed Tragodia within a monster tablet, which even still could not fully contain his power, still aware of himself even when sealed, prompting the priests to shatter the tablet and scatter the remains to be buried in the royal tombs. There he lay for 3,000 years until being unearthed by archaeologists, whom he promptly possessed. Body hopping from soul to soul, searching for what he needed to return to the mortal realm, eventually taking the body of a card designer to create his all-powerful planet series cards, being Aster's father, and landing in the body of Principal Mackenzie, where he used his influence to search for the spirit that still held his heart, the winged Kariba. After defeating Jaden using a possessed Atticus Rhodes, Tragodia regathered all of the pieces to his tablet, which with the spirit of winged Kribo added back released him in his monster form back to the mortal realm, giving Jaden and Chaz a single opportunity to reseal him once and for all. However, there was one more spirit that Tragodia forgot to count on. While in possession of Koyo, winged Kribo blessed a young boy's card with the spirit of the Feather of Mott, giving the card a spirit of its own, and the power to defeat Tragodia if he was ever to return. That boy was Chaz, a young fan of Koyo's, and the card was Light and Darkness Dragon, the last hope of resealing Tragodia once and for all. With the combined efforts of Jaden and Chaz, they are able to fuse Wing Karibo and Light and Darkness Dragon into the spirit of Mott itself, whose ability allows Jaden to chain draws and cards together as long as he can call the card he's about to draw, a simple feat with Mott providing him the foresight of the Millennium Items, bringing forth Terra Firma once more to defeat Tragodia, with Wing Karibo and Light and Darkness Dragon giving up their spirit forms to seal track away once and for all. With the evil defeated, we're treated to the epilogue set years later, where the world champion Koyo Hibiki is back, released from his shadow game induced coma, and is being challenged by the new big up and coming rookie, Jaden Yuki, giving him a chance to finally show his idol just how much he had grown as a duelist. Honestly, this ending is about as perfect as you can get for the setup provided, as Tragodia is an absolutely terrifying force to be reckoned with. Bringing Lad's involvement full circle was pivotal, and the ending plus the added one shot of Koyo and Jaden's duel gives us a satisfying conclusion to the series with my only complaint being that the final chapter is a bit rushed given that Shonen Jump most likely cancelled the series a chapter too early to make room for 5Ds coming soon after. A trend they seem to repeat a lot considering some other series they cancelled at the very end of their runs. At least with the follow-up one-shot, we get to see the first half of Jaden and Koyo's duel, showcasing the masked heroes in their final glory in addition to a showcase of Koyo's deck back in its owner's hands. All in all, the GX manga, 
while criminally short, holds some of the best pieces of the entire GX series itself. And if you haven't experienced it yet, you absolutely should give it a shot. All of the chapters are available through Viz Media's website with a Shonen Jump subscription, which I do heavily recommend as it's the best way to read the series outside of the nine physical volumes. With that said, thanks for listening to the ramblings of an insane man for the last 20 minutes. I do enjoy getting to branch out into the weirder aspects of the Yu-Gi-Oh! franchise between videos like this and the video game one prior. So if you enjoy this type of content, please let me know in the comments below. An extra special shout out to my patrons, Dammit Marco, Teo, Jukes, Mick Jaga, Otaku GamerX, Prinrin, and Ryza339, as well as all of my other patrons over on Patreon.com. If you want to help support me to make more content like this, please consider supporting me on Patreon, where support tiers start at just $1 a month in exchange for one day early access to all of my videos. Link in the description below. Lastly, if you did enjoy this, please consider subscribing to the channel. We've seen so much growth over the last year that it's absolutely insane to me, and everyone who's subscribed so far has helped with that growth. So a big thank you from me. I'll see you next time.